This is just the job. Hi and welcome to the third series of Just The Job. We are so excited to be back and I want you to stick around over the next 10 weeks because we have a whole lot of unique and really diverse careers for you to check out. Now to get the series rolling, we have an extra special show lined up for you. We're going to be looking at three careers with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Now I've got Lisa Dolivera here with me. She's a squadron leader and she's in charge of recruitment. And Lisa, what is it about the Air Force that makes this such an awesome place to work? While most people think of pilot as the most obvious career choice in the Air Force, there's a whole range of really diverse careers that we've got on offer here with lots of great opportunities. So hopefully people will discover that as they watch today. Awesome. Well, coming up in today's show, Nikki is going to be flying high when she gets the chance to experience life as a pilot in the Air Force. Monish from Manurewa College thinks aircraft avionics would make a fascinating career, so wants to find out more to see if it could be just the job for him. And Jerome from Onihunga College is already involved in the Air Force Cadet training scheme and is keen to see if a ground support role could offer the challenge he is looking for. So let's join Nikki and see if a high-flying Air Force career could play a part in her future. Hi, I'm Nikki Payne. I'm 18 and I'm from King's College. I'm quite interested because I originally saw the commercial side as my mum was a flight attendant, so I thought I'd have a check out of the Air Force side of being a pilot. That's great, Nicola, because there's a lot to learn about flying for the New Zealand Air Force. And Flying Officer Aaron Lloyd is going to get you started. Hi, Nicky. Hi, nice to meet you. You too. My name's Aaron. Welcome to Fenua Point. Cool. Uh, here's your uniform. Awesome. You interested in being in the Air Force, Nicky? Yeah, quite interested in flying and being a pilot and that. Oh, great. Well, let's, um, let's go put a flight plan in the system and get going. Sweet. There is a whole lot of work to be done before a plane like the C-130 Hercules even gets off the ground. So Aaron takes Nicola to base operations to prepare a flight plan. Okay, well normally if we were going up on a flight uh, in New Zealand, this is one of the reference maps we use. This yep. is a north-south uh, airways chart. The chart identifies the highways of the sky, and pilots use them to plot their course. They consult satellite imaging to check weather patterns they will encounter on the way. What's the worst weather condition that you guys can fly in? Uh, the worst weather for us uh, taking off would be um, a zero foot cloud base, 800 metres whiz. So not so, much puts you off. <laughs> uh, not really, no, just need the 800 metres whiz so you can see the runway in front of you. Yep. And uh, the cloud can be right down to the deck. And with all their decisions made, the course information is then fed into the air traffic control system so that their flight can be coordinated with all the other flights around New Zealand. Preparation for a flight generally depends on what the type of flight is, whether or not it's a training flight, um, a tasked flight in, uh, in support of a mission, or a tactical flight. Aaron flies the C-130 Hercules, which has a wingspan of over 40 metres and a maximum speed of 610 kilometres per hour. The plane has a flight ceiling of 10,000 metres and can travel 3,800 kilometres without refuelling. Well, Nicky, this is the uh, flight deck of the C-130 Hercules. Cool. You see on the left there is where the captain sits, yep. uh, co-pilot sits on the right. Uh, the seat here is where the flight engineer sits, and the seat here is where the navigator sits. What is the Hercules mostly used for? Mostly used for transporting cargo and, uh, and all people. Why don't you take a seat in the co-pilot's seat there? Cool. Co-pilot's job to pre-flight the aircraft, so we'll go through what needs to be done. Yep. Just making sure that the lights are all set up uh, for the cockpit, yep. for what we need. Uh, moving across, getting uh, oxygen. Okay. Weird. <laughs> I've always wanted to fly the Hercules, so I'm uh, interested in the, in the number of operations that uh, the C-130 performs all over New Zealand and all over the world. And it really is an aircraft that uh, I think goes everywhere and uh, does everything. Well, Nikki, this is the cargo compartment of C-130. We carry 80 troops down the back here, 80 cool. people. Also, be, also can be configured to carry equipment or a combination of equipment and personnel. We can fit to drive on vehicles, pallets, uh, even an Iroquois helicopter down the back. Huh? The Hercules aircraft are also used for parachute drops, which requires great skill from the pilot as they often occur at night and from low altitudes. But to get that good, they need to keep their skills sharp and Flying Officer Matt Ferris is doing pre-flight checks for a training flight to Gisborne. Hi Nikki. Hi, nice Great to, to meet you. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Matt Ferris, uh, I'm the co-pilot today and uh, we're just going on a training flight out of Fenuapai. We're going to go to Gisborne, do an instrument approach there for training. We'll do a stop and go, so we'll, we'll stop the aircraft on the runway, turn around, take off again. Hopefully you enjoy it if you've got any questions, please ask. I think 
the challenges of the Hercules is uh, the integration of the entire crew, bringing everyone together as an entire crew. You can't get the aircraft airborne with any one person, you need the whole crew, and uh, working together as a team uh, can, be, uh, can be quite a challenge. It's pretty easy because I've got to be a little pilot, so I'll do most of the work right now. <laughs> Nikki is sitting in the engineer's seat and it's the engineer's job to manage the engine power and fuel consumption. The navigator sets the course, the pilot and co-pilot fly the plane and the load master looks after the cargo. And they all like to have a bit of fun with each other. My favourite part is, is um, the people I work with. <laughs> I was very close to saying that. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> Got the wrong crew for that, yeah. eh? <laughs> Head structural staff are warm and friendly. <laughs> it's a loving, positive environment to learn in. Yep, that's, that's the official answer I think I'll stick with. A good Air Force pilot is uh, one that is continuously learning and improving and looks at his or her flying uh, from an outside perspective and uh, continually wants to improve. The Hercules regularly lands on unprepared runways and even the Antarctic ice. But today they descend towards Gisborne Airport for the point of this training trip, an instrument approach and stop and go landing. They don't even get out of the plane and are soon on their way back to Whanuapai. And although he's got a navigator sitting behind him, the co-pilot has a good grip on where they are in the sky at all times. A lot of mass involved. <laughs> uh, not a lot. It's pretty simple what, what mass is involved. It's not nothing hard or anything. But there's two ways. You can either work it out or you can just guess something. Yeah. And usually they're pretty close, which is all yeah. you're meant to take. So if it goes horribly wrong, you can blame it on bad mass or a bad guess. Usually one and the same. Question. The joking is put aside as the team gets ready for the serious business of landing a 36-ton plane in low visibility conditions. Just one of the many challenges a RNZ AF pilot will face. Well, I'm looking forward to future upgrades and future challenges. I'm looking forward to getting into to low-level tactical flying in, uh, in the Hercules. Uh, combination of uh, airdrops and uh, combat uh, onloads and offloads, uh, working in um, shorter un unprepared strips, doing a, a, a variety of missions, dropping stuff out, out the back. I think that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Oh, I think Nick, Nikki's uh, prepared to give it a go. I think that's, uh, that's definitely been evident. She's uh, keen to give it a try, and I think that would uh, a quality that would uh, suit, suit her well. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed getting to see the ins and outs of being a part of the Air Force, and it was really exciting to be up in the Hercules. To enter the Royal New Zealand Air Force, you must be at least 17 years old, a New Zealand citizen, or have New Zealand permanent residency if you are a citizen of the UK, USA, Australia, or Canada. You will need 18 NCEA Level 2 credits of English, Mathematics, and a Science subject. Physics is preferred. Pilots need to be self-disciplined, know how to lead, and work well under pressure. They must have a good level of fitness, health and strength, including good hearing, eyesight and normal colour vision. You also need to be given security clearance, so any criminal convictions you have will be looked at. Well Lisa, you're in charge of recruitment, so how do you reckon Nikki went? She did really well Clinton. We're always looking for bright and enthusiastic young New Zealanders, and she did a really great job. She's got all the attributes to be a great team player. Well, she certainly looked at home in the huge Hercules, which, to be honest, I was slightly jealous about, but I'm now in the hot seat. And maybe this is something you could see yourself doing, or perhaps you're more interested in how things work, in which case this next career might be more your thing. After the break, Monish is going to find out what's involved in a career in avionics. This is Just The Job. Welcome back to our Just The Job Air Force special. We hope this show will give you an insight into just some of the amazing opportunities that the Air Force has on offer. But right now, we're going to catch up with Manish and find out what a career in avionics is all about. My name is Manish. I'm 17. I go to Manorewa High, and uh, I have a very great interest in the aviation industry. 
Well, you're in the right place, Monish, because the Air Force has a range of jobs for anyone interested in aircraft. And leading aircraft man Chris Anker is going to show you the critical work done by avionics engineers. Basically, what we're going to do today mm -hmm. is uh, take you through a couple of the instruments on the aircraft, yeah. show you what we do as avionics, mm -hmm. and uh, then we're going to shoot back to the bay and try and fix them. Okay, so let's have a wee look. Yep. All right, mate. This is the uh, flight deck of our uh, C-130 Hercules. Basically, all these gauges, uh, what we look after is avionics. We've got uh, fuel gauges, pressure gauges, various things like that. It's such an important trade because if anything were to go wrong, it's the safety of all the people in, on that plane that falls on our shoulders. So if, if we do something wrong and the plane crashes, that's a huge deal. We're, if something doesn't get right, done right, there's, there's potential yeah, for those, those people to... There's potential for loss of life. It's, it's quite literally that important. Squadron base technicians identify faults with equipment and send them back to the bay to be fixed. And Monish is going to have to fix an HSI unit. This is the glide slope indicator. And what that tells the pilot is when it's uh, coming in for a landing, it's the ideal angle for the aircraft to be approaching at in order to make a very successful landing. And what happens when this flag displays itself is telling the pilot that that information being received into the, the instrument is unreliable. Right, we'll get you to fire it up. That's those two switches there. Okay. If you just flick those, what should happen is all the flags should go away. Okay, and as you can see, the glide slope flag is yep. still shown. And after confirming the fault, they have to identify the cause. Okay. Oh, look at that. You see there's a loose wire. Yes. That's probably what's causing our problem. A good avionics person should be have a good eye for detail, have a, a good interest in electronics, and be interested in, in planes in general. Patience is a, is a big key factor. You need to be able to keep cool head and nut it out. So if you want to flip the power back on. Yep. And the flag goes away. Nice right. work. Nice fixing on HSI, it's great. In the Air Force, Smoko is called Joe, and it's a perfect time for Monish to relax and have some fun with the other avionics staff. <laughs> I think it's a lot different to what it's commonly perceived to be. But I, the impression that I got as, as military when I, before I joined up was that it's all just marching around and, and doing disciplinary type of stuff. It's, and the reality is quite different. But they are soon back to work as Chris introduces Monish to the P3K Orion, which carries some serious avionics hardware. It's a maritime patrol vessel and used primarily for such rescue type operations. It uses the uh, infrared turret here, also the radar and a couple other boxes on the plane in order to try and locate people while they're in the water. So this is the TACRA. Each one of these stations is um, some, uh, an operator city yeah. and they control different parts of the aircraft. The infrared electro-optic turret is a highly specialised piece of equipment and Corporal Karim Aldara is going to show Monish how it works. It's the colour and stuff um, like that. You can use that button there, yeah. you know, it swaps between the cameras. The turret is gyro-stabilised and can track moving objects automatically with the help of special software. So they don't need to twist. No, no, they're all looking at they're all looking at the same thing at the same time. Inside the turret, there is a colour daylight camera, a high zoom spotter camera, and an infrared one as well. Yep. And, then, yeah. and then you can zoom in with the with the other button on there. I'll show you some of the things the system can do. Should be able to pick this up. The infrared camera sees heat and turns it into an image, which makes spotting a warm-bodied person against the cold ocean much easier. OK, my next here we are at the uh, radar bay. This is um, the same radar that we looked at on the P3 before. Yeah. It's um, radar, stands for radio detection and ranging. Basically what it does is it will send out a pulse, and that pulse will then reflect off objects in the distance and then come back to the receiver. Basically what that does is it will paint a picture of the terrain or the uh, the weather, depending on what the, the radar is tuned to. Well, this particular radar, it has a bit of a fault with it. This survey just here, mm -hmm. it's uh, gone kaput. For <laughs> and we need to change it. The servo spins the radar at 150 revolutions per minute. But this one's not going anywhere. 
There you go. As you can see, it's not moving. So that's our fault confirmed. Now what we need to do is fire down the power and change that servo. When it's working, the radar can emit 2,000 pulses a second, revealing a phenomenal amount of detail from the surrounding world. Okay, we'll pop that on the bench over here. Now we have a, uh, a service one from stores, mm -hmm. and we're going to open this up. That's all right. Yep. And that needs to go back where the other one was. So with all Monish's careful attention to detail, will his radar repair get things spinning again? Look at that. Nice work. I think he'd make a great idea of this technician. He's, he seems to have the, the discipline down, he's um, focused, uh, seems to have the right attributes for the train. Yeah. With the radar fixed and installed, the Orion is on to its next mission. So how has Monish found his time in avionics? Definitely my favourite part would be fixing up the HSI unit and that was fun because it was really ticky and finding the fault for it and soldering it and doing it by hand, it was really great. Avionics engineers need to be accurate, patient, effective and be able to follow instructions. They should be practical and logical in their work with good hand-eye coordination, normal colour vision and must be comfortable working in confined spaces. Three years of secondary education in English, Maths and Science is needed before starting training and previous experience in electronics or electrical work is useful as is experience as a mechanic. That was really fascinating, Lisa. The avionic technicians obviously play a vital part in keeping our Air Force flying and our people safe. Yes, Clinton. We just couldn't go flying without the hard work that these guys put in fixing our communications and navigations equipment. It's a really fascinating job for anyone who's interested in electronics or fixing things. Awesome. Well, if you think a career in avionics or a career as an Air Force pilot could be for you, then you can find out more information about these careers on our website. So go grab a pen and paper. We'll have all those details for you at the end of the program. After the break, we're going to find out all about what a career with the ground support crew involves. This is Just The Job. You're watching Just The Job, and in our first show of our brand new series, we're checking out three careers within the Air Force. Now, Lisa, tell us what we've got coming up next. Next, we're going to look at safety and surface. Now, this is a really great job for anyone who's practically minded. It also has all the benefits of being in the Air Force, such as living on the base, subsidised food, accommodation, medical, and of course, travel. So it's definitely got a lot going for it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lisa. We're going to catch up with Jerome and see whether a career in safety and surface could be for him. Hi, my name's Jerome and I'm 18 years old and I go to only Hunger High School. I thought, you know, the Air Force would be a great place to see um, what options are available to me. Well, Jerome, there are heaps of opportunities as part of the Air Force's safety and surface team. And leading aircraftman Anthony Nansen Moran is just the guy to show you around. So let's go check it out. Sweet. Our mission is to save lives, basically, through providing the perfect safety equipment so one of our jobs uh, as a safety and service technician is um, to uh, pack parachutes. This one's an MC5 parachute, so uh, the paratroopers will uh, jump out with them. We also pack uh, emergency chutes, also uh, static line parachutes, so they're the round ones, um, they can jump out the back. So there is different kind of parachutes? Yeah, there, there are a lot of different parachutes oh. that we pack. This is the waist strap, and check the other little straps, sweet. So a lot of straps. Uh... Yeah, we don't <laughs> want it coming off in this yeah. way. Okay, we'll also put this uh, rip cord in. Typical day um, as a safety and surface technician is, there is no typical day, it changes constantly. Um, challenges pop up every five seconds and it always keeps you on your feet. Everything's quite technical though. Yeah, definitely. And you have to pay attention a lot. Yeah. Attention to detail. Slider, slider. Yeah, that's why it's called a slider. slider. Yeah. <laughs> then we want to get all the air out. Like kind of like a sleeping bag. Yeah, it is, it is. It's not as easy as it looks. No, definitely not. <laughs> so this is the um, uh, pilot chute, and it assists in the uh, deployment of the parachute. It's a yeah. big spring. It's very hard to put it down, so you have to hold it there and then oh. close it as well. What makes a good safety and service technician is um, attention to detail, uh, proactive. You have to work with the highest integrity as possible. Um, yeah. Making sure that nothing goes wrong. Yeah. Okay, so this is 23 oh. kg. <laughs> it is. It's quite heavy. <laughs> yeah. Very heavy. Yeah. So you just punch yep. it out. 
Okay, so it's not Jerome up there, but he still felt a thrill. <laughs> you can just feel the, the release. Just, see it, just boom. Yeah. Yeah. This Hercules is on phase, which means the entire plane is stripped down and maintained. Safety and surface technicians are responsible for checking the plane's skin for defects and all the interior fittings, including the seats. One of the things we check is the weather. The yep. stitching's come apart. So what we'll do is we'll go fix it, me and you. Yep. The training's quite intense. We have two years of training all split up into courses. In between each course we do a lot of on-the-job training. We'll do a course theory, just learn the basics, and then we'll go on to other bases and into the bays. But we'll do a lot more training and get familiar with uh, a broad range of equipment. Eventually, after a couple of years, you'll be onto it, you'll be perfect technicians, and you'll be saving lives. All enlisted Air Force personnel must pass periodic fitness tests, and today Anthony has to complete his, and Jerome will be joining in. 16 to 29 year olds must perform 30 continuous press ups before beginning a 5k run. Three, two, one, go. The yellow vests weigh 20 kilograms and simulate the effect of carrying a full operational kit, including helmet, flak jacket, and rifle. But yeah, to do this every six months or a year, oh yeah, it's, it'll be hard, eh? you're in good, you'll be in good shape. <sighs> While Anthony finishes the run, Jerome is off to meet aircraftman Marshal Tapania, who will show him around the paint shop. How long have you been in the Air Force for? Uh, I've been in the Air Force for just over a year now. Yeah, it's been awesome, I've spent most of my time down in Woodburn, base Woodburn, yep. down in South Island. Yeah, it's been awesome, just been learning so many new things, eh? Yeah, so you're still learning. Um, what do you enjoy the most? Um, oh, it's just I, I enjoy the hands-on work. Like most, so during training, a lot of it's theory, but once you get into the actual mm. practical work, it's just awesome, mate, eh, the amount of stuff that you can do. Marshall and Jerome get down to painting the wheel hub from a hook. Did you want to have a go? Yeah, bro. The importance of the paint shop is we need to display everything as professional as we can. We're pretty much doing it for the Queen, so we are bringing it out there so she knows that we are the best. This is some more equipment that we maintain. It's an Ice Commander suit, so it's kind of like a dry suit. If the plane goes down and freezing temperature, um, the water's very cold. Uh, and this yeah. will preserve your life for a maximum of 12 hours and zero degrees. 12 hours? Yep. <sighs> yep. Emergency conditions, if the plane's going down, you normally have about to, uh, two minutes to put the suit on and the life preserver. We'll give it a crack, eh? Sweet. That's 40 seconds gone. These suits are the last line of safety for Hercules aircrew flying in Antarctica, so their maintenance and preparation are incredibly important. Hold on. And aircrew need to practice drills with the suits on Hercules that have been pumped full of smoke. This is all the way up to the top. That's one reason we don't have long hair in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> over your mouth, over your mouth. <laughs> Done. It took five and a half minutes. I don't know if you'd survive. <laughs> but hot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> How do you breathe? <laughs> it feels like I did the run again. <laughs> and if Jerome thought that was hard, Jump. Getting into a personal life raft is a completely different story. Grab the lead, find your, find your life raft, pull it harder. You wouldn't usually have this suit in a plane with this life raft, but then again, most planes don't crash into calm swimming pools. So Jerome is getting a good lesson in how important it is for equipment to work properly. Safety and surface technician is a great job. It gives me flexible ability, always constantly working or travelling. I, I can travel with um, what I do. I've seen a lot of uh, different places, met a lot of awesome people, and the atmosphere around our trade is just perfect. How was that? I wouldn't want my plane to crash. <laughs> Jerome's done excellent. He's the perfect person for a safety and service technician. 
I reckon he should join up. He'll be the perfect person. And with a goodbye memento from the team, what did Jerome think of the whole experience? I thought Air Force, flying planes, you know, just saving people, but I just didn't know how many actual jobs are included in the Air Force, you know, um, safety and surface. Uh, there's just endless jobs, really. Safety and surface training is some of the most thorough and advanced in the world. As your career progresses and training is completed, you'll be eligible to apply for national certificates in aeronautical engineering support, aircraft equipment and furnishings, or aircraft painting level 4. Technicians attached to the various flight squadrons can expect overseas postings in support of their aircraft. On graduation, you'll be contractually obliged to spend another 24 months in the Air Force. Now this man has achieved a lot of things in his time and I'm very excited to introduce to you Air New Zealand CEO Rob Fife. It's great to have you on Just The Job. How are you Rob? Yeah good, thank you. Well um, you've been in the Royal New Zealand Air Force uh, for a while weren't you? I had uh, nine years in the New Zealand Air Force so straight from school at 17 through to 26 when I uh, left to go into banking actually. And Rob what advice would you give young kids who are wanting to get into the Air Force? I think it's important to have a clear sense of what you want from the career. Uh, you may go into the Air Force with a, a long-term endeavour, say I want that to be my career for the rest of my life. You may go in to gain some skills that you see as a springboard to doing another job. Whatever your motivation, go in with a very clear perspective and be honest about that. Uh, be honest with yourself and be honest uh, with the Air Force and, and just then chase, chase your dream. Uh, but go hard out. My belief is life's too short to find yourself working in a role or doing something that you don't have a real passion for. So whether it's the Air Force or whatever career you choose, make sure you're chasing it because you have a real passion to want to do that. And that pretty much wraps up our Air Force special. A big thanks to Lisa, you're awesome, and everyone else who featured in today's program. Today there are literally thousands of careers to choose from, but sometimes the choice can be a little overwhelming. So we certainly hope our programs will help you to decide. And to help you even more, here's Sarah from Career Services with this week's tip on how to navigate your way to a great job. At Career Services, we see hundreds of young people every year who say, I should know by now what I want to do, but I don't. With so many options, it can be really confusing and hard to choose. Some people just know what they want to do, so for them it's a matter of figuring out how to get there step by step. But for everyone else, it's about getting started in something that's interesting, giving it a go and seeing where it might lead. Careers.govt.nz has some great interactive tools to help you start figuring it out. Well that's it for this week, we'll be back again next week with three different careers plus a whole lot of helpful career advice and tips. If you want more information about the careers featured this week at the Air Force or just more info about how to make that right career choice, easy, just jump on our program website at www.tvnz.co.nz and enter the keywords just the job. Good luck and I'll catch you next week. Hey guys, what's the chance of me getting a ride to my red car? Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.